You know, the proper segue from Sam Raimi's The Gift last week would probably be for the love of the game, but I'm just going to skip one ahead and go to Field of Dreams, so you know what? Sue me if you don't like it. Welcome to Debt to Cinema. I'm Stephen Maltmanex. And I'm Brian Gillis. Like most people, we love going to the theater and catching latest releases. However, you can sadly put a big dent in your wallet. Fortunately, living in the digital age makes the viewing possibilities endless from the comforts of home. Many of these films that you can see right from your couch, we're ashamed to say we miss despite labeling ourselves cinephiles. So join us as one or both of us cross off a title from our list of shame. It can be an all-time essential classic. Or an underrated piece of cinema that's worth giving a shot. Hell, it might just be some trashy film we want the other's opinion on. So sit tight and join us as we pay off our debts, one dollar at a time. I have just created something totally illogical. That's what I like about it. What? Who will come? You didn't say. I hate it when that happens. Me too. Hi! Oh, hey. oh, hey. You couldn't see it. This is really interesting. You believed in the magic. It happened. Isn't that enough? Annie, it's more than that. I feel it as strongly as I've ever felt anything in my life. There's a reason. Go the distance. Did you hear the voice too? Did you hear it? Go the distance. Yes. Our grave is dead. He died in 1972. Are you Moonlight Graham? No one's called me Moonlight Graham in 50 years. Unbelievable. It's more than that. It's perfect. You build a baseball field in the middle of nowhere, and you sit here and you stare at nothing. This field, this game, it's a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good. Hey, is this heaven? No. It's Iowa. Kevin Costner. Amy Madigan, James Earl Jones, Ray Liotta, Burt Lancaster. Sometimes, when you believe the impossible, the incredible comes true. Field of Dreams. So, we're watching this the other week. You watch yeah, Dances I mean, with Wolves. Uh-huh. That's typically the deal with everything, though. Yeah, <laughs> but... Uh, on this podcast, it's a point. So, like I said, last week you did Dances with Wolves, so it kind of seems like you're doing a Kevin or Costner thing. Yeah. How have you never seen this movie? I, it, again, I just haven't seen it. It's not something that anyone has told me to see. Um, you know, it's What never kind of friends been... do you have, then? No, it's, it's never been on a must-see list, like, and I, I've just only heard, like, you know, I've only known it by name, by its reputation, by the... Uh, you know, the if you, he build it, he will come. Uh, mm-hmm. Voice like th- that. That's it. I I only knew that, but I didn't really know anything. It's it's that movie that. Well, I mean, that's a good like, thing. I mean, yeah, it seems like this is that thing that's um, very. But I, I want. I guess late eighties. It's eighty nine. You know, it's ingrained in eighties uh, culture. Like you know, you know, you recognize it when you see what it is. But I just never really saw it. I always knew what it was, and that's it. Well, are you interested in baseball? Yeah, I like sports movies. Um, but well, you know I what? would that's... hardly call this a sports but movie. But I, yeah, no, I mean, I, I appreciate the sport, or the game itself. I mean, just with any other sport, really, you can find the. Uh, ways of appreciating it but yeah i mean no it's not like um it, it's not like i was uh avoiding it just because it was a baseball movie or anything if that's what you're trying to get at i'm not sure no i'm just curious because you know we, we've done like bad santa and gremlins and a couple things not too long ago um and then i i usually pick the weirder stuff when it's my week uh, that a lot of people haven't seen I might be getting back to that, and it's not going to be something uh, along the lines of the holiday special. Good. Most of the stuff that we picked, you know, they're like pop culture, pop culture staples, or it's a crowd favorite or anything like that. And this is one of those as well. But I think that this is just the flat out best movie that we've done on this show so far. You know, it was critically acclaimed, not made for best picture, best original screenplay. It sadly lost that year to Driving Miss Daisy. We're talking about 1989 here. Uh, Dead Poet Society was also nominated that year. Talk about a misstep by the Academy. And now everyone, you know, the hashtag Oscar's so white. Um, so they were trying to correct things back then. And they picked, like, the most... It, it's still, like, not racist, but... Well, here's the thing. It's funny so that ans- you... It's non-progressive. <laughs> It's funny that you say that Oscar's so white thing because I was doing a I didn't do full on research after watching uh-huh. this, but I did see that the director his one regret in the movie 
not like, one black one thing baseball that he player would change is that yeah he would add more black baseball players in there well, just there, so it could there be there weren't many back then though. there were some though like yeah, that, that's his some, one yeah. regret for for when it's uh, all the different players and all, of different teams that are coming out near the second half of the movie he's that's yeah. what he would have done and again Jackie Robinson is supposed to be an asshole so i can understand why all the white Sox players wouldn't pick him to play with them it's like they have that Ty Cobb joke you know and so like <laughs> I'm sure they could have just said Jackie Robinson instead. So, you said you like sports movies. Have you seen Eight Men Out? No, I haven't. No, it's from 1988. It it's kind of like I a know, sister I know what story. It is. Yeah, it chronicles. Yeah, what, what is there? Uh, there's Eight Men Out. There's The Natural uh, that I haven't seen. And well, this um, is actually like tightly related to this film because that movie deals with the Chicago White Scott uh, White Sox scandal, which is also kind of what this movie is about. Like you know, it has a lot more to it. Um, but yeah, that was released the year before this, so maybe there's something like, oh, it's been 70 years since the baseballs went into the Hall of Fame, let's do it, or something like that. Uh, I checked that out, though, it's John Cusack, it, like, like this, it is about baseball, but it's more than that, like, it's more of a, a crime slash, like, court case movie. It's it's funny, I I think as far as sports movies, the only baseball movies I I saw, I, I think it was just Angels in the Outfield, and that's it. You haven't seen uh, for the no, love no, of the no, game. No, no, I saw the rookie also. Um, I saw that in theaters, but yeah, the Disney baseball—that's really it. What about for love of the game with Kevin Costner? I mentioned that in the intro. Actually, I have to get to that See, too. Though. It's a uh, really like Kevin Costner is known for three baseball movies. This is one of them. The other one is the one I just mentioned for love of the game. And the third is Bull Durham with Susan Sarandon and Tim that's, Robbins. That's another one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so he has like three really good baseball movies that a ton of people love and this one is the least tied to baseball itself like i said i i just think that this is a fabulous just fantastic in the real sense of the word like this is a fantasy uh, it's a supernatural story kind of like the gift to but not on the spooky side <laughs> of the spectrum but it just makes you feel like a certain way and like what how what was your response to this film? Like, I, I wish I could see it again for the first time. I think this is the third time I might have seen it. At, definitely the second. Very, very weird, um, actually, because yeah. I, I know, th- I think this is definitely, I don't know, it, it, I want to say this is the most cerebral movie of its kind that's trying to appeal more to emotions, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. No, yeah, that's really great. I, I, I mean, yeah, like, it's it's definitely, um, it, it is a movie that by design is supposed to pull at the heartstrings, but I feel there's actually a lot more there to it. I mean, because it's not, it, 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 baseball is the center of it, but it's not a baseball movie. It's really an existential journey when you get down to it, and even though it's, on the surface, it's filled with so much, so many emotions, and it's supposed to move you. There are many layers as to what's going on through this journey. Uh, yeah, not just for Kevin Costner, but for um, for James Earl Jones, whose birthday is um, today. Right? Exactly. Yeah, which uh, we're recording this uh, Sunday, January seventeenth. By coincidence, it just happens to be his birthday. Happy so birthday, that's Darth Vader! Cool. Yeah, uh, Mufasa, dude. Verizon guy. Best dad ever. Don't you remember those Verizon commercials before they got the Can You Hear Me Now guy? Oh, yeah. That those was, were so yeah, weird. Was years ago. <laughs> it was the late 90s. Those commercials were bizarre. My uh, stepmom actually met him because of that ad. She used to work for the Verizon Yellow Pages. And so at some kind of, you know, conference or convention or something like that, she she met him a couple of times. Must be a really nice guy in person. Uh, interesting thing about his character, in the novel, Shoeless Joe, it's actually J.D. Salinger. I think I might have talked about this, not necessarily on this show, but our show in general before. Um, there's, like, two movies about J.D. Salinger, and neither, he's in neither of them. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's this one, and then there's Finding Forrester, which is Gus Van Zandt's follow-up to Goodwill Hunting. Um, and they're both recluse writers that are known for one novel, and then, you know, It's kinda, pretty obvious yeah. that, I, you know, I mean, I found out later, oh, so it actually was supposed to be yeah, him, but it no, literally it's clear that he's him. modeled yeah. after him. Yeah, in the novel, it literally is Salinger. Instead of being the, the, the boat that rocked, it is Catcher in the Rye. It is weird how, uh, just upon watching it for the first time, how these pieces are supposed to connect together. But, you know, mm-hmm. you can't really apply uh, logic to it. You, yeah, you when it's a ghost I mean, story and there's all this weird stuff happening. But, I mean, let me ask you this. When you saw it for the first time, how old were you? Um, I want to say it was the end of high school, so I was probably like 18, 17. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I mean, this is definitely for kids. Or not for kids, yeah, it's for the whole family. But I feel like if you were a kid, it would have hit you in a different way. Like, it, there's a cynical side for me that's just looking to apply logic uh, to this thing. Uh, and, and, I mean, I can... Like, this is like a Spielberg movie. Well, not yeah, Bridge of no Spies, way. but, you know, like E.T. or Close Encounters type of thing. But it's not operatic, though. Or it's, well, it's I mean, not, James I'd, Horner's score makes you feel that way. It is, and it's funny, because that's not a score that is, like, very big and bombastic. No, 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 it's no, just no. It's a It's very minimal, and, yeah. very atmospheric. It makes, like, it, if you heard this out of context now, you would immediately know what it was just because, like, it, it's a very iconic s- score. It's just not in your face. It, it's very, um, like, just surface, if you will. Uh, but it, it definitely gives off that mystical nature this film in, imbues in you. It, not only that, but I mean, just those shots at Magic Hour. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's it's very beautiful to uh, look at. Like, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's very, it is very much, um, you know, a movie that just wears its emotions on its sleeve. And I, it, I just I like the fact, though, thinking about it, that there are more layers to it, to this journey, um, that which is basically, I, at the end, you know, I do feel like it surpasses that as opposed to just being emotionally manipulative. Like, yeah, it, it does earn it. And it's not, for me, it's not just for uh, Kevin Costner, though. I mean, th- there's this big thing. Uh, should I spoil it now, or do you have anything that else that you want to say? Um, not really. I was just going to talk about Gabby Hoffman. Did you notice that that's the daughter? The little girl, that's Gabby Hoffman from Transparent and Girls. Wow. Yeah, this is like oh, her man. first that's, role. That's Adam Driver's sister? Yeah. Wow. Slash one of the, the the youngest daughter in Transparent. Wow. Yeah, this... I she, mean, you know that... Age didn't, wasn't so I, nice I know that this is, this is uh, something that I make fun of movies for now, though, when they have the cute little girl in there just for uh-huh. the sake of being the cute little no, girl. No, she's important Yeah, here. that's here. It's like, but it, I don't know. Maybe it's that 80s charm where it feels like it's more suited for the time because she really doesn't do that much that's different for uh, from um, how it's done now, even though now it feels more manipulative. Or, uh, maybe it's just because I'm older. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, there's like two or three scenes where she's pretty important or like she says something that changes the direction of where the conversation <laughs> was going to go um she's just fun like she, she especially like towards the beginning when kevin costner's making the field itself and she's like what's a that and and she's helping him out and like eating the popcorn and making like just all that kind of stuff it'd be awesome if she had a like you said, like if she had a, a presence that was more felt, like if she was actually necessary to the story more than just oh the Kevin Costner is a dad and he's a husband. Yeah, and like he's it's going become on a journey. cliche now, I think. Uh, but it, it's it's fine. It doesn't really bother me too much. Like it's it's not being shoved in my face. I don't feel. But let me ask you this, James Earl Jones. Mm-hmm. Do you think he was a ghost? No, I kept thinking that like near the end because the ending did seem sort of weird. <laughs> To me, you know, he all of a sudden has this speech about how they will come, and it's—I I wasn't exactly moved by it while I was watching it because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, "What is going on?" And then they ask him to go with him, and that's—that's that's just where I was trying to add it all up. Like, wait, is he dead? That wouldn't necessarily make sense, would it? Because he was interacting with people, but then I rewatched that scene, like when the uh, when the brother-in-law shows up, and like, like who is this Elvis? Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could make a case, though, too, that the way that he says it, he just, Kevin Costner looks at him like, no, he can't see. You could make the case that, oh, he can't see someone who's not there. And, like, yeah. No, because he you shakes know, he's his hand. Like, but it looks like a fake handshake, too, and James Earl Jones just kind of laughs it off. Like, that's the only interaction. You look at that, it could be possible that from his perspective, he's just waving in thin air. No, I won't like, argue with I'm, I'm sure there's someone else on the Internet that's probably said something like that. Um, I just see well, you know, all the all the ball yeah. players or the ghosts or I I wouldn't even use ghosts or right, we'll say spirit okay they, I will say this I mean just the reason I'm bringing it up like I was ready to um, just come in questioning that but then I thought more and more about why that was done you know thinking okay this is actually this is another protagonist there is a reason why he goes into the corn because he has an arc and yeah I think that makes sense even if it's kind of logically strange if you think oh, no, that, it, uh, that the way I see dead. it that makes sense for his arc though that he is a recluse yeah. and he decides to get out and go into the unknown and that I think 
Yeah, yeah, so that that makes it more better for me. But yeah, that really was just messing with me today <laughs> after I watched it. No, to be honest. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. That the fact that he's kind of left the earthly realm already, and he's doing his own thing, like kind of staying in his his own apartment, doing nothing, just you know, writing these programs for kids on computers. Yeah. Um, that you know, like he obviously has a way with words, even though that these people are dead. Uh, most of them probably died after his work was known. Um, and they're probably just lending him the invitation because of his, his rousing speech. Like it was special. And the way I, I like to imagine what the thing that happens, especially with that pulled away at the end, when you see all these cars, um, after, <laughs> which is a beautiful, shot. very beautiful shot. Yeah. Um, I have to imagine that after whatever time he spent with them in the corn that he comes out and then he writes his next novel and then you know, he has a reason to live again. Like, you, you know, he, he has a motivation. Like there's that when he decides to go on the journey with Ray, with Kevin Costner and he stops his Volkswagen bus and he tells him like, you know, you, I don't have a reason for living anymore. Like I wish I had this. And, and now at the end, um, he has it. That's the way I see it. That's the way I hope it is. No, I, I I'm with you. Like I, the knee jerk reaction. I, I think it's just adult cynicism that takes over. That makes me uh -huh. kind of want to call bullshit because you look at this logically. You can't look at it believing logically. like, <laughs> it, no, no, it's like, you, you know, it's, I, I can't help. It's like, I look at it logically like thinking, okay, this movie makes me want to think that this is happening in that reality when really it's just more, it's expressionistic. It's a fantasy. Like it, it's more than just a fantasy though. It's, it's a magical movie. Like, this isn't a fan scene yeah, the way it, that... But it's not, it's not like, without purpose, too. It, yeah. It, like, everything that's whimsical is done to express uh, something that is relevant to the story and to these I'm, characters. What was like, fun it, you know, watching yeah. it again is I paid attention to the opening Ken Burns, like, photos going on. Because <laughs> um, those really helped tell a lot of the story that is between the lines. Like, that had to be exposition that really mattered in the Shoeless Joe novel because um, they set it up, everything. They talk about his father and the baseball and all that stuff that you kind of forget. And then his his dad um, is mentioned throughout, you know, and just like little bits and pieces. And you, you kind of just brush it off. It's like it's not about him. It's about the field. And it's about Shoeless Joe. And it's about finding this recluse rider and finding some kind of answer to something. Uh, but throughout, there's a, there's a trail of breadcrumbs that connect everything to his father um, I think that's why this movie is special is because it's, it's a movie that men can watch that is about emotions that, you know, it's under the guise of baseball. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I have to imagine that there were a lot of straight men crying in theaters when they saw this back in the late 80s. I mean, that's part of the reputation that this movie has, too. Yeah, it's, it's like, you're only allowed to cry during certain movies, and this is one of them. <laughs> or, like, the ending of Save It, Private Ryan. Or, um... Did you cry during that? I don't know. I saw it too young. So <laughs> I, I was like, what the fuck? Fuck you, Matt Damon. You're, you're supposed to be an angel right now, okay? You're supposed to be hanging out with Ben Affleck. But yeah, just... You know, I got uh -huh. one more thing to bring up just because sure. I actually... I almost forgot this, but then you mentioned the opening. Uh, this is just a funny thing. I kind of uh, knocked on Kevin Costner's voiceover in Dances with Wolves. Did you? And yeah, then at the beginning of this, I, you know, because I just thought it was kind of empty and it uh -huh. just seemed like he was bored and reading a paper. It was very much Harrison Ford and Blade Runner uh, type of uh, voiceover. I, th I think he's just not a good voiceover actor. Well, now. I don't think with, he with has this, a good voice. Uh, he just like, his thing, like when, especially he's shirtless in this. He doesn't have a nice body. Um, like his thing is, you know, he's just like everyday average Joe that looks a little mm -hmm. bit nicer. And he's a little bit kinder on the eyes, but he, there's nothing special about him. And he has charisma. He has charisma, though. Yeah, it's, like he has a good smile and he has nice hair, you know. But like, if you were in Hollywood and you had makeup and a hairdresser and a stylist, you would too, you know. And it's interesting. When did Dances with Wolves come out? It was like 1990, a right? A year after this. Yeah, a year after. And he wasn't really known before this movie. Um, like he had a couple things among them, Bull Durham. And I could find a list on INDB, but I'm sure there's not a lot of things that stand out there, like bit parts and guys on the side. And then it's a good thing a, he's breaking out of the uh, stereotype of being the baseball guy in Hollywood. So yeah, that, then that's Dances true. with Wolves came along. Yeah, so that's uh, probably a big surprise. But then after that, what's interesting is you know it's only like five years after Dances with Wolves and, until he does Waterworld, and then his career kind of oops like look at him now making draft day and uh what, what was uh, the one about him having a black daughter it was like color doesn't matter or something like that 
Um, yeah, and then there's McFarland USA. Yeah, and, like I mean, he, you know, he's still he's still, he's still active. Able to headline a movie and you know smaller stuff like or middle uh, be- budget movies because of the power. I think, of, I think he's likable enough on screen. Yeah, I think it's because of the power of this movie though. Like this is kind of the one thing in his resume that people go, oh yeah, I've seen that. I really like that. I like Kevin Costner because um, in my mind, like he's in Wyatt Earp. He's in the movie that competed with Tombstone. <laughs> okay. I, I never I've never seen that movie. I want to at some point, but Tombstone? No, no, no. I own Tombstone. I have the special DVD okay. with the, the yeah, fold out OK Corral second. map. Really cool set. Um, but no, can you imagine him playing a better version of uh, of what Kurt Russell did in that movie? I can't. I really just Kurt Russell looks at the camera a certain way, and you're like, oh shit, I almost pissed myself. And who was the? Uh, I can't remember which one it was. Either Burt Lancaster or Kirk Douglas uh, in uh, Gunfight at OK Corral. I I, I don't know. That that one's also talking about yeah, Burt Lancaster. He's in this. It's his. This is his final yeah. film. I mean, it's a good one to go out on. He has a really great role in this film, even though it's it's pretty small. About just as equal presence as his daughter, basically. It's funny I, don't know, I really how much. That. I mean, this might seem completely random, but this just came to my head. I, I just thought of Steven Spielberg's film Always. I haven't seen that. Uh, I know that's a J.J. Yeah, Abrams it... movie, though. Hmm? No, 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 no. It's... That's... Yeah, it's what? Is that the one that J.J. No, 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 wrote? No, uh, J.J. wrote regarding Henry there you go. Uh, for Mike Nichols, which yeah, is yeah. great, actually. You should see that. But yeah, Always. It's funny, very similar because it's very much it's uh, about fueled by emotion. And I not be as, and about your father, right? Uh, sort of. I don't know. It may not necessarily be as strong, but yeah, also that had Audrey Hepburn's last screen role, and that was 1989, and both have mystical elements. So it's, yeah, that thought just came to mind. I don't know. That might be completely useless, but that's interesting. That's, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, v- visually, yeah, they're both beautiful, too. Nice. Probably, I was yeah, going to say. Similar feeling movie. I don't have much to say about this. I think most of our listeners have probably seen this movie just because. It's a widely known film, a, a highly regarded one. I just, I love the, the tone it has. Like it, it it's kind of serious, but everyone seems like they're having a good time. Um, it just, it's playful while being mystical. It's hard to make a ghost story seem real. Um, and maybe it's just James Horner's great score and the Magic Hour stuff, and you know the great child actress here. Mm-hmm. But it, it just it's right, and what's interesting is, I like I could pull it up right now. But do you know the director's name? Do you know anything else that he's I done? I don't know. Um, right, like I, he he did some episodes of Band of Brothers. He directed that Angriest Man in Brooklyn uh, the other year with uh, Robin Williams. But he's practically an unknown. It's interesting. Like you get nominated for Best Picture. And you just flow like fly under the I don't radar. Know, it might be his attitude or something because I saw his name on. Um... Just on uh, some IMDb trivia, apparently, yeah, he was really nervous about getting this movie right. Like, pr- probably, you know, perfectionist. I-, I don't know. Maybe it might be his attitude or something. I don't. I'm not gonna pretend that I know. But uh, anyway, you know what? Yeah, it's uh, like you said. A lot of people have seen this, and that's part of the reason why I'm doing this podcast. It's giving me the excuse to finally fix some stuff. And yeah, I'm glad that I finally got to this. It's it's really interesting because it's got. It, there are those. It really has that. Uh, that feeling like that just dates it back in the 80s uh but it's just something about it really stands about above that you know there's this mystical feeling throughout and i i cannot exactly describe it but yeah it's it's uh it's a very nice very pleasant movie that uh ended up being better than just uh like i i thought i would if i gave this a positive review i would label it as like a feel good 80s movie and it is that but it's also better than that it's a very great movie uh just for trivia he also directed the Sum of All Fears and that Sneakers movie with uh, with with uh, Robert Sum Redford. Sum of All Fears ain't bad. Well, it ended a franchise. Yeah, that got well. Well, thanks for listening, guys. I hope it's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed it, you can find updates and when episodes go live on Facebook and Twitter at Dollar Reviews. You can follow me personally on Twitter at Brian Gillis. That's B R Y O N G I L L I S, and also under the same name on the lovely site Letterbox, which acts as my film diary, where I rate the films I watch on an almost daily basis, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at s underscore mtx, and also follow my film diary at letterbox.com. My username is also s underscore mtx. 
There, I log everything I watch and sometimes write brief reviews. If you'd like to contribute some talking points, you know, maybe send us a film or two that you'd like for us to review, or just some feedback of any sort, you can do so by sending us an email to dollar.review at gmail.com. And if you want to hear more of us, you can find our entire archive at dollarreviewspodcast.wordpress.com. We're also on iTunes, where you can download episodes and listen to us anywhere, and you can also hear us on SoundCloud and TuneIn Radio just by searching Dollar Reviews. Until next time, keep the change.